Hi, good morning, everyone, and um, I'm uh, honoured to be asked to um, share some more data with you. Um, I'm going to talk about um, our experience in administering pegylated disparaginase to um, a population on our uh, current ongoing trial, UCAL 14. Um, so uh, just to orientate you, the UK has had a long history of doing um, trials for both paediatric and ALL, and uh, we're now on 14. We skipped 13. Um, for I would have just done 13, but I don't think people would have participated. Um, and <laughs> so we're uh, currently on UCAL 14. And... Um, Although we didn't specifically design the trial to look at um, pediatric style therapy, uh, we updated our regimen from the UCAL 12 ECOG 2993 trial to be as in line as possible with um, what we felt was um, a more intensive regimen. So we shifted um, prednisolone to dexamethasone, all sorts of different things. And um, But one of the things we set out to ask specifically was a question um, about asparaginase. So I'm going to show you some data from our trial. It's ongoing. But we reached um, one of the endpoints regarding the pegylated asparaginase, so we had to make some changes. And I think it's quite instructive to see what happened. And I'll just share with you a, a little bit of data that um, Rachel Hoff gave me from um, the completed pediatric trial, uh, UCAL 2003, uh, into which patients up to the age of 25 are enrolled, because it's quite instructive to look at the, at the big differences in toxicity uh, that occur uh, between younger adults and, and older adults. Um, so um, UCAL 14, this is an older uh, slide. It's uh, plans to recruit uh, 760 patients in total. Um, we're currently now up to almost 400 patients. Um, and there are some um, different questions that were being asked in the trial. So one of the main aims of our trial is to ask randomised questions about um, rituximab and nilarabine. So for patients with B precursor, ALL, all patients are randomised to receive rituximab or just standard induction. Um, and we're not measuring CD20 um, to determine whether patients should receive rituximab, but we're prospectively finding out what the correlation is between CD20 expression and subsequent response to rituximab. And for patients with TALL, um, they're randomized to receive an additional course of nilarabine or just to continue with standard therapy. But one of the other um, aims of our trial was to determine whether pegylated asparaginase is tolerable in induction. And because we have the luxury of having a randomized arm with rituximab, we're also interested in whether anti-asparaginase antibody formation um, differs between the uh, rituximab arm and the non-rituximab arm, which is a question uh, raised by the previous speaker. So it will be interesting to know that. And the other questions are relate to transplant and are not relevant to my talk today. So I'm just going to focus on some data um, that we acquired uh, pertinent to AIM2. And just to remind you, this trial is um, open for patients from the age of 25 to 65. And um, as, an, as some correlative science, uh, we also um, are looking at asparagine depletion and, and uh, anti-asparaginase um, antibodies. And uh, one of the endpoints, uh, the primary endpoint to the pegylated asparaginase um, aim is in regard of toxicity. So we've done our best to collect um, a very complete toxicity data. And just to remind you that um, we are doing um, MRD quantification in this trial. And although MRD at the end of phase two is used to stratify patients into risk groups, we're also monitoring MRD at the end of the first phase of induction. And that information is not being given out to sites. So it's helpful if we can, we can get some early indication of how responses are going. Um, so this, I don't think I need to dwell too much on this, but uh, the overview is that all patients, whether they have T or B um, lineage ALL, receive pegylated asparaginase in a non-randomized fashion, um, whereas, and it doesn't matter what randomized arm um, they're entered into. 
Um, this is an important note as well. We've got very broad eligibility criteria because this is a national trial and we want as many patients as possible to enter. Um, so we don't exclude anybody for a poor performance status or poor organ function at diagnosis because we feel that the data that we should get should be as applicable as possible to the real world. Um, so that's another issue because... Um, you know, some smaller or um, phase two trials with pegylated disparaginase can afford to be a little bit selective. So we've got a population here, um, some of whom don't have perfect liver function at diagnosis and may have, uh, may have comorbidities. Um, and just to remind you um, that we have um, high-risk features that direct patient subsequent treatment. And one of our main aims, um, as, as we discussed yesterday, was to try and direct um, patients over the age of 40 to reduce intensity condition transplant to ask the question uh, whether that's an appropriate thing to do. So clearly, um, if we have excessive toxicity um, during our induction or an excess of deaths, we're not going to be able to um, get people through to that. That. So it's quite, in, uh, it's quite important. So um, to show you the data, um, so just to orientate you, our induction regimen um, at the time when we started this trial, all patients receive a steroid prephase of five to seven days, um, and then they go into a first phase of induction with a fairly hefty dose um, of anthracycline. But this was the same dose that was used in uh, the UCAL 12 ECOG 2993 trial. Um, they received dexamethasone in a, in a, in a pulsed fashion, and patients um, were assigned to receive pegylated disparaginase at 1,000 um, international units per meter squared. Um, um, on days four and eight of this regimen. And obviously some patients were randomized to rituximab. And for all patients, so patients with Philadelphia positive ALL are also included into our trial. And um, all those patients receive um, continuous imatinib alongside um, the regimen that's listed here. And subsequently, um, at the end of that, once they've recovered from the myelosuppression, they will then go on and receive um, phase two. Um, and it's at that point that uh, patients would um, receive nilarabin if they're randomised to do so. So I'm just going to show you data from the first um, 91 patients that were enrolled into this trial because it became apparent to us that there was an excess of toxicity and an excess of deaths and induction that we were concerned about. And uh, so we had to um, make sure that we looked at this in great detail. And obviously, our, our data monitoring committee and trial steering committee were um, very concerned and very helpful to us in looking at this with us. Um, so we, we, we noted that um, the CR rate was... Um, was, was not as high as we thought it would be, and it was largely because we had a lot of deaths in induction. Um, but this here just shows you the, uh, the patients that I'm talking about. Um, so the median age of the, of the patient population is 47, which is considerably older than uh, most of the populations we've been talking about today. And there were quite a few patients um, over the age of 50, Five, which is also important. Um, quite a lot of those patients, uh, as you may imagine, had um, high-risk cytogenetics, and because um, of it being an older population, uh, quite a lot of patients um, had Philadelphia-positive ALL. So we'd noted a high rate of induction death. Um, so this uh, just summarizes the flow here. So 91 patients uh, are, are, what, are what I'm talking about. Um, 90 patients, uh, unfortunately, one patient died before starting treatment. Uh, 90 patients started phase one of induction. Um, and unfortunately, 18 of those patients had uh, died before they were able to um, complete the second phase of treatment. And two of those patients died due to um, uh, refractory or progressive ALL. But 16 of those patients um, died of treatment-related toxicity. And clearly, that's a very significant thing. In a trial of this magnitude, you've got to take it quite seriously. And this curve just shows this here. So we have a, you know, a very steep drop-off um, during induction. So we started to, uh, we were very concerned that it was related to the pegylated disparaginase, and so we started to look into that in more detail. And um, as you can see, the median uh, number of days to death is 26.5. So people were dying very early on in the protocol. And um, a lot of these patients had only received uh, one dose of pegylated disparaginase. And there was a, a fairly close relationship between receiving the pegasparaginase and uh, dying. 
And this, uh, this slide here shows uh, the pr predominant causes of death. And uh, we looked into this in great detail. So rather than just having the data that was sent to the center, we interrogated um, the physician uh, for a narrative about every single patient. So we got a lot of information about what had happened to the patient. Um, and this was requested of us by the trial steering committee. So this is a, a very sort of granular information here. Um, so, as you can see, sepsis was um, a huge issue, but a lot of patients also had um, extreme uh, liver toxicity at the time of death. And there were some other issues. So, um, a, a couple of patients, it was felt that a thrombotic event was the major cause of death. Um, in, in two of those patients, it was a bowel ischemia, and um, in one patient, an acute coronary syndrome. And again, we believe that these were likely to be related to pegylated asparaginase. Um, there were a, a couple of individuals in whom hemorrhage um, contributed to the death, only one in whom hemorrhage was thought to be a primary cause, and that was a gastrointestinal bleeding. Uh, pancreatitis uh, only accounted for the death of, of one individual. So in a univariate analysis, um, we tried to look at what factors were um, responsible for this toxicity. And the main thing that uh, came out of that was older age. Um, so the thing that was very closely associated um, was being over the age of 40, especially, uh, but being over the age of 55 was even worse. Um, and there was a correlation with high-risk cytogenetics, and in particular, when we drilled down into that, there was a very strong correlation with uh, the presence of the Philadelphia chromosome. And in a multivariate analysis of this, um, basically, the two things that came out were um, older age and Philadelphia status. And, and so those two things were in, because it's a multivariate analysis, those two things were independently predictive. So obviously they're related to each other, but they came out as independent predictors of the toxicity. We also had a look at, at non-fatal toxicity. So this uh, slide here just shows the grade three, four toxicity. Um, as, we, as the two previous speakers have discussed, uh, liver toxicity was prominent, um, hyperbilirubinemia, um, a particular issue. And also, as the previous speakers have mentioned, um, patients who just um, developed hyperbilirubinemia did eventually generally all recover um, but some of them had very high bilirubins for you know weeks and in some cases months and often it precluded any further anti-ALL therapy so that's a, a really uh, quite a major issue interestingly we didn't um, we didn't actually see much of hypersensitivity and I don't know if that bears any relation to the fact that uh, some of these patients had received rituximab but we will eventually um, get to know that when the randomization uh, data are analyzed. Um, so older age was also a very significant risk factor for the non-fatal toxicity, um, so, uh, but not any toxicity. So older age was a, it, the, the random sorts of toxicities we see. Pancreatitis didn't appear to be related to age, but the liver toxicity was um, strongly related to older age. Um, we were able to look at um, asparagine depletion in a subset. Unfortunately, we didn't have samples on all of the patients. Um, but as you can see here in the subset of patients in whom we were able to do this analysis, um, a very significant proportion of the patients did have um, a lot of... This was by the MART assay, by the way. A lot of... Um, uh, so a lot of uh, apparently asparagine depletion. And we had a quick look to see if there was any relationship between minimal residual disease at the end of phase one and asparagine depletion. Now, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, specimens available for analysis in all of the individuals. And, and that's partly due to the fact that a lot of individuals had died before we got to the end of phase one, so we didn't receive a specimen. Um, and so there's no statistically significant correlation, but um, the numbers may suggest suggest um, some correlation um, when we get further numbers we'll know about um, asparagine depletion and the depth of response at the end of phase one. So obviously as the data mature and we get more, more patients that will be interesting to look at further. Um, another major issue is the association of uh, toxicity with reductions and delays. So we had a look to see whether the non-fatal toxicity was associated um, with this. It was quite difficult because this data is quite difficult to record and code properly. So I'm not sure that um, 
we have all the information that we need. It, it, to, to our surprise, there didn't appear to be a strong association with, with treatment delays, um, although there was um, an association, but not statistically significant, um, with subsequent, um, subsequent reductions. But I think with larger numbers, we'll need to, uh, to do this analysis again. So because of this, we actually took some action. So we felt that the high levels of early treatment um, associated mortality um, being strongly associated with older age and Philadelphia positive disease, we had to modify the regimen. So as a consequence, uh, we decided to omit the day four pegylated asparaginase for all patients over the age of 40 years. So those patients continue to receive asparaginase at other times during the protocol. So, and again, I think this, this speaks a lot to what Dan has said this morning. It's about timing it right, you know, because our major issue was giving, give, getting this terrible toxicity during the time when people were very myelosuppressed because of the dornarubicin. And we also decided um, to reduce the dose of dornarubicin. And is it, it's kind of a, a brave thing to do, but we took a look at, um, at pediatric protocols from around the world. We took a look at what the um, other mod, um, ALL study groups doing, and we thought that our, do our dose of dornarubicin was probably excessive. Um, and so the dose of dornarubicin um, was halved. And uh, one year on, um, we had another look to see what difference uh, the amendment to our protocol had had. So I can just show you a little bit of follow-up data on 123 further patients who have been uh, recruited. Um, and the induction death rate uh, declined very steeply after we made that modification and came down to 6.5%, which I'd like it to be lower. But in a population aged up to the age of 65, it's probably um, uh, acceptable. Uh, one of the things that we're obviously very concerned about in, in taking away some elements of treatment and induction was would we, um, in the long run, impact um, the relapse risk? And obviously it's going to take a while for that to work through, but an early way of looking at that would be to look at um, MRD. So we had a look at the number of patients who, um, uh, well, first of all, we looked at rem crudely looked at remission rates, and there was no apparent uh, difference in remission rates between uh, pre and post our amendment. And when we looked at the MRD at the end of two phases of induction, um, again, we didn't see any difference in the rate of MRD positivity um, after we'd made the changes. So looking early on, it didn't appear to have negatively impacted um, the, the anti-ALL activity of our regimen. I've just got a couple of uh, survival curves to sort of illustrate what I've said. Um, so we can see here that um, if we look at the 25 to 40 year old, uh, which I guess is a population that's the major focus of this meeting, they're not doing too badly. But the patients over the age of 40 uh, were doing less well due to this very um, high uh, early mortality. And if we look at patients, uh, if we cut that by a different age at 55, um, it's even worse. So the early mortality is highly significant. Um, and um, having carried out the amendment that we did, um, we significantly <laughs> impacted that. So as you can see, this is um, obviously the there's not very long follow-up here, but you can see uh, pre and post amendment, we've, we've, we've really got rid of those, um, those early deaths. And just a couple of slides I've got from uh, Rachel Hoff, who's a member of our study group, just to contrast um, what happens in younger individuals. So in younger individuals in the UK, they're all um, enter into the actual pediatric trial. Um, we've negotiated with the pediatricians that we would have um, 25 years of age as a cutoff. There's no no um, data to support that. It's just a practical way that we decided in the UK that we were going to have to uh, measure that. And looking at toxicity um, on that trial, so this is the um, 16 to 25 year olds. You can see the the, the hike in toxicity here. Ten, it appears to be um, above the age of 10, but generally um, induction deaths are low. But there doesn't appear to be any difference in the 16 to 25 year old versus the 10 to 15 year olds. Um, although there's a slight difference overall in the number of deaths in remission. Um, and one thing that's really interesting to note is uh, the, the, the distribution of patients in the MRD categories here. Um, so that's one thing that is different. So if we look at the people below the age of 16 and people above the age of 16, um, there is um, 
a very highly statistically significant increase in the number of patients who have, um, have high-risk MRD status at the end of induction. And uh, that translates into the following survival curves. So we can see here now for the 16 to 25-year-olds who've got low-risk MRD, we have a really excellent outcome using that pediatric regimen, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, for those who don't um, manage to achieve a minimal residual disease response, the, the outcomes are less good. Um, but I'm pretty clear that um, this type of uh, excellent outcome is not going to be replicated in the over 40s or the over 55s or the over 60s using currently available regimens because they're just too toxic. Um, so we need to rethink uh, really entirely how we treat ALL in older individuals, I think. Um, so in conclusion, um, there's clearly very, very strong support for using pediatric protocols in young adults. And non-myeloablative agents such as pegylated asparaginase are really key components of those protocols. And in our trial, UCAL 14, we attempted to update our protocol to um, try and deliver a, so, a sort of pediatricized regimen to an adult population, non-selected, um, up to the age of 65. And our data show that although pegylated asparaginase does achieve effective asparagine depletion, it's very difficult to deliver that safely um, over the age of 40 years. And starting it early in induction is not the way to go. Um, we've just got to get people... Um, uh, over the myelosuppressive agents first. Um, and general conclusions, obviously, need about age limits. Uh, we'll obviously, when the trial um, reports further, we'll have more data. I just want to thank everybody who's uh, involved in running the trial, UCL, my university, Cancer Trial Centre, run and coordinate this trial, which takes place in 70 centres across the United Kingdom. Uh, my lab does the MRD. They work really hard to get those data out to everyone. We've got a really fantastic, committed uh, trial management group. And actually, we've given the... Um, the uh, trial steering committee and data monitoring committee quite a headache and they've had to put a lot of work into uh, looking at this with us you know there was a concern that we might have to stop the trial and I think it's it's you know a really a testament to everyone's hard work that we were able to get all this information really, really quickly, review the protocol and make some changes. And uh, thanks to everyone in uh, in the ALL subgroup in the UK who, who work on our trials. So thank you for your attention.